father, Squire Victor Roberts, who was born here in the late 1800s. In 1909, he went on to Meharry and graduated from a medical school there, and then the whole family migrated off only to St. Louis. Unfortunately, uh, dad, my grandfather died when my dad was about 16, so of course I never knew him. Well, back then they didn't have cell phones, so we weren't able to connect with family back in that time. But we heard names every once in a while, and one year I made it back to West Point on my own. Of course, it was right up to the Roots uh, series was up, because I was trying to see if we had our 40 acres and a mule someplace around here. <laughs> So I went into the uh, city hall area, Mr. Mayor, just to let you know, and to see if there was any property in our name, but I didn't see anything. But I did have a suggestion made to me, and that is to look at the census of the elementary schools back then. And the books were in with the names of colored students and white students. So as I look back, starting around 1900, I found my granddaddy. But I also found a, a Viola. And some of you might know her. She became a lady. And therefore, it was the strangest thing. A hundred years later, my brother and I came to Jackson, Mississippi. And we bought first a TV station, then a radio station, and then we bought the Walpole Hotel. Anybody know that hotel downtown? Well, I, I told you, friends, this morning, I heard that uh, Walpole was a general of the Confederacy, so I immediately changed the name to the Roberts Walpole Hotel. <laughs> And we held it for a few years before we sold it. Uh, and, but when we went into the city, Mr. Ben, the first thing we wanted to do was get our political visa in order. Because right out of law school, I moved two blocks from the projects where I lived for 10 years. And I was elected to the city council where I served for eight. Two years following me, my brother finished law school. He moved into our old neighborhood. And he became a city councilman or alderman. And at that point in time, we had two brothers on the St. Louis City Council. And Ebony did a very interesting story about the Roberts brothers doing a one-two punch of city government. <laughs> we were young and vicious and doing what we could to help turn our city around. Well, at the same time, we were busy looking at inner city properties and, and building uh, taking over homes. Sadly, there were homes that I noticed that parents and grandparents had spent their lives working day and night to have for their children. They worked hard, that was their legacy, but when those kids got overly educated, they moved to the suburbs and left the family assets. Well, at that point, we said, well, there's gold in them, their streets. So we started to buy properties. And then from that article that I referred to that came out a big feature in Ebony, now mind you, we're in our 20s, early 30s. Sears and Roebuck called and said, we're moving out of the black neighborhoods. Well, they didn't quite say that. <laughs> but because if you remember, when the neighborhoods around the country turned African American, they left. And we were born just two blocks from there. We said, you know what? We're not going to let our own neighborhood and that building just become, uh, go to sea and become a, a, a place with drugs and all kinds of derelicts. So we bought the building. They offered it to us. We, uh, we put together what's called creative financing. In other words, we lied about how much we were worth. <laughs> Uh, come on now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Who was it, Reagan? What are they, what are they called it? Uh, uh, voodoo economics. And, and, uh, somebody else talks about, you know, you're going to dress for success. Well, I think it's you fake it till you make it. <laughs> Long story short, we 
began our journey of buying commercial properties, residentials, renovating, and then we found, found ourselves moving into the TV business, and we owned about 12 full power television stations, the largest African American owned group of stations ever in the uh, United States. And we bought about 13 hotels over the years. We've taken three companies public. And it's interesting because when you look at all the successes and you talk about them, we always felt, well, perhaps we should pass that information on. And by passing it on, I wrote a book, Action Has No Season, The Strategies and Secrets of Getting Wealth and Authority. And I talked about the nearly 100 businesses and over 11,000 people that worked for me over the years and what that really meant because 99% of them were black. And I found it interesting as I looked at other TV stations and hotels and I saw the leadership of those of being all white and all of my hotels were all led by black folks. Most of them by black women, I'm by that ladies. <laughs> But it's extraordinary how we can find folks that nobody else can. <laughs> well, I say to you that in the world of business, which I love, that the reality is we're in a different type of mindset. Sometimes we are so nice that we're taken advantage of. Sometimes we are the better qualified, but we're, we are, they're promoted over us. But when you own your own, right. when you sign the check and somebody else doesn't, there's a big difference. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about changing the mindset of us, getting us in a different state of mind. You know, if we lived in a socialist nation, we'd be called socialists. If we lived in a communist nation, we'd be called communists. We live in a capitalist nation. But for some reason, we're afraid of that word. We think it's a bad word. And yet, you live around it and you're exploited. Well, I say let's reverse that. And if, if we're going to have an exploitation, let's do the exploiting. Let's establish ourselves in businesses and ideas let's be able to give back to the community so we can do things and fight for what we need. Like my cousin Norma over there, y'all don't know this, but she had a huge history of standing up against white folks and saying, y'all just not going to let our kids play in the sandlot. You are going to find a ballpark for us to build. And as a result of her standing up, West Point ended up with a ballpark that little Curtis could play in back in the days. <laughs> I know I'm embarrassing you, but that's okay. <laughs> How do we change the mindset? Well, right now we are habitual. We are people of habit. All of us. And somehow in our frontal lobe of our brain, that's our creative side, we always find ourselves falling back in doing the same thing over and over again. For example, it's like the compass that points north when you're doing the same thing over and over. Let's give an example. Here's some french fries and here's a salad. I'm trying to lose some weight. <laughs> but my compass keeps shifting me over to the french fries. <laughs> we have to find a way to avoid the compass from facing due north and begin to look at other directions. So that's true in life and that's true in business. So when it was time for us to look at giving back, Curtis and I came together and said, let's create the concepts that are emerging and then present those concepts to our African American students. That was the genesis of what's now known as the Roberts Innovation Group. You see, if you go to the HBCUs, they're still basically teaching you the fundamentals of education. I get that. I don't think we should avoid it. 
But when I talk to the presidents of schools, I'll ask them and I'll ask you, where will people be spending money 10 years from now? I'm a futurist. That's why I got a head and I built a wireless phone company from the ground up and then sold it to Sprint for $300 million. <laughs> because we were changing from the concept of an analog phone. You remember the snap, crackle, drop? <laughs> Where the coolest person in the theater had a nice big telephone in their briefcase. <laughs> well, today, these little things called digital phones have incredible amount of data, infinite data. Now imagine in the future, the ability for there to be something called a nanochip that can be placed in your brain and you will be able to have the same data that your cell phone has today. You, you'll close your eyes and you might see yourself skiing or scuba diving. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, now slow down a little bit, Brother Roberts. Let's, let's slow down a little bit. Back up on you. <laughs> there was a, uh, a rat in a lab on the East Coast. Uh, they took this rat and they put a memory chip in the lab, in the brain of the rat. And they put the rat in front of a maze. And the rat had to find its way to its reward. And over and over until it got, but once it remembered where it was, it just walked it. Then they took that chip, sent it across the country, used the same maze, put it in a different rat, and guess what happened? It moved right on through as if it knew exactly where to go. Now mind you, a great part of my presentation this evening is to be very disruptive to you because I need you to begin to think totally different. I want you to think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, cryptocurrency. I want you to think in terms of those 10 years from now, not only what will people be buying, but also what will be the currency Will it be Bitcoins, Ethercoin? Uh, how effective will it be when you're ready to buy something in Singapore and you can look on something called the blockchain and pull up data that is stacked and is immutable, meaning that the data on that property you buy has all the information and nobody can pull it out and change it. So when I'm ready to buy it, I can just look at that we will become a peer-to-peer -peer purchase. You will own the property. I will want to buy it. I'll look at your property on the, uh, on the blockchain. You will look at me. I'll send you cryptocurrency to buy it. The transfer will take place. Now, what did I just do? I just eliminated lawyers. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, really, I just eliminated real estate brokers. I apologize. <laughs> I, I actually also eliminated banking. You see, the, the future allows for these types of things. Uh, if you look at the types of nano sensors that will go in your body, that will allow you to have a different lifestyle and a length of life, that sensor will be able to tell your heart rate your blood pressure, it'll be able to send that message of your condition. So one day you'll wake up and you'll have these little microchips on your mirror and you're going to look at the mirror and you're going to say, mirror, mirror on the wall, what's wrong with me? <laughs> the mirror will, ex will take that data from you and send it to RoboDoc. The RoboDoc will then evaluate what is seen, and then RoboDoc will prepare the prescription and send the prescription to RoboPharmacy. The RoboPharmacist will fill the prescription and they call the local drone company who will then fly it from there to your house and your robot will take it, bring it to you, 
and as a result, you will feel so much better. <laughs> I don't want to sound like this is too far off. You see, Anyone who has a job that is repetitive in nature, you will not have a job within the next 10 years because robotics will take that job and make it more economically feasible for the manufacturer or whomever you may be working for. When I was riding around uh, with Curtis the last two days, I saw more uh, soybean fields than I'll ever want to see the rest of my life. <laughs> but I can only imagine when those were cotton fields. And my ancestors were working, and your ancestors were working in those cotton fields. But then technology came along, and there was something called the what? The cotton gin, right? And as a result of that, many people lost their jobs. So they moved to the north, and they worked at the Ford plants and other plants that were emerging. But what happened to those plants when, when technology stepped in there? Now we see these robotic arms assembling vehicles, don't we? Yeah. So the question becomes, are we preparing our students to be able to receive the emerging opportunities? And there will be many hundreds of thousands on a global level of new businesses, creative businesses, that's going to be there for us to inherit and to develop. And by the way, finally, this is a place where black folks can enter at a level playing field. We don't have to sit back and let somebody else teach us how to have a job or what to do. We have these young creative minds that are busy now sitting at home a two-year-old will take your phone and show you how to operate. And I'm letting you know now, don't just take away those, those iPads and, and whatnot from those kids and say you're a book. Books are going to be all right. We're not going to leave that. But trust me, we have to let the creative mind of our children move, create the new apps to create the new inventions and the concepts that are going to be emerging. And all of us are going to find it. You know, it's not going to be a new, a brave new world. It's going to be a new beneficiary world. Because with 3D printing, for example, you will see houses built by computers. Humans will live much longer than we've ever lived before. There are more people over the age of 60 in the country than under the age of 15. So what's going to happen is with 3D printing, if you lose an ear or a body part, it'll actually reproduce it with your DNA. You know, most people die as a result of an organ that goes bad. So imagine if your liver is bad or your heart is bad, that science can now take that DNA and reproduce one for you. So what's going to happen now is that life expectancy will extend, which means more other types of businesses will occur because those folks are going to need to do things and live in a certain uh, life with a certain lifestyle. Uh, one of the things that Curtis and I talked about was, well, are we going to constantly need to have senior housing? Housing for grandma, grandpa. Yes. But how about this? How about housing for grandmas raising grandkids? Think about that. We know that that happens in our community. So why are we preparing and evaluating a concept that would allow for that to take place? All right, but somebody's going to take that and make millions of dollars. Would you get my 10%? <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, I always joke, I say, yeah, I'm a capitalist. I'm a cold-blooded capitalist. But cold-blooded in the Rick James sense. Y'all remember Rick James? <laughs> so we're going to see these emerging concepts, this emerging business, uh, 
3D printing, as we talked about, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is huge. You don't know it now, but for example, the street lights, that's running through artificial intelligence. The water that's coming to your house is being pumped by some form of artificial intelligence. What we have to make sure of is that as we get closer to having this concept of, of, of your brain connecting with the infinite knowledge that your cell phone has, now okay, everybody be ready because this is going to hurt a little bit. Imagine that you have a brain that is like a, a computer, so now you're sort of a sidebar, so to speak. What's going to happen when we get a brain hacker? <laughs> and suddenly you're doing things that you don't realize now. I want the judges to understand that's in the future. So don't, uh, you know, if you guys are considering the problem, make sure that that person wasn't hacked. <laughs> But life is moving. The problem we have to make sure of, especially in the African American community, is that our culture is usurped as a result of it. What do I mean by that? Two things. First, you remember the, the old Amos and Andy and the black face where white folks were taking our humor and using it and financially benefiting from it, right? right. Okay. Well, there's a, a, a new avatar. An avatar is, uh, is, a, is, is something that looks like a human. You can put on the glasses or you can see it. And the avatar is uh, uh, moving uh, and acting as if it's you, in some cases. Uh, and, you know, we're looking at a business now, Curtis and I, uh, that's dealing with the metaverse. And the metaverse means that you'll be able to look at this room and see each and every one of you, but you won't be in there. And you'll hear speakers and you'll have, but you may be at your home, you may be looking through some glasses, or there may be even a lens that you'll put on your eye and you'll be able to see all this. Well, recently there was a beautiful model. Uh, this sister, uh, I think her name was Sienna. Very dark, gorgeous, perfect skin, and they are using this avatar as a model. And somebody's making money on it. This black woman image, but it's a white man who owns it. So once again, that culture, our culture, is being stolen and being used by them. See, if you look at how AI, artificial intelligence, is developing, and our legislators, please listen to this part. As AI, artificial intelligence, is being developed, we have to be very careful that whoever's putting the data in, that's training that robot or training that artificial intelligence database, is not putting in a bias along with it. Because when they put that bias along with it, we're back to redlining again. We're back to them saying, okay, this person is applying, let's look at that history, let's go to our database, let's look it up. Uh, mm. uh, let's see something here. This, uh, this looks like a pretty good potential, but hey, they went to Morehouse. What does that mean? If they haven't seen them the bias gets set in as a result of that. So we want to make sure that culturally, as artificial intelligence is being built and developed legislatively, we want to make sure that anything that is put in is not biased, especially racially biased. Am I making sense? Yes. Am I starting to disrupt you a little bit? Yes. Because the reality is you and us and our children will be in this environment before you know it. We're actually in it now, but we haven't quite accepted it as we should. But as a futurist, my mission is to try to, to impart to my folks what's coming. Not to scare you, but to something for you to embrace and look at how you can make money. Because when it's all said and done, as 
kids say, Mama, they put it, ain't nothing funny. It's all about money. money. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so when we created the Robinson Innovation Group, we wanted, we wanted to go to the HBCUs and take our team and begin to, to set with our college students and our, our presidents of our schools, listen, let us set up a lab. Let us work that lab and let us bring the students in so that they can do it. We need to have incubation type facilities all over West Point. Where should we do it? Listen, if I've driven past one, I've driven past 15 churches. And they're only open on Sunday. And they have beautiful facilities. Let's get our ministers connected to the possibility of opening up a room and a facility so that in the evening, our young people, but not just our young people, anybody who has a concept that works in their mind, bring them in. Let's get into having hackathons. What is a hackathon? That's when your entity, your let's say that this one given church has a, uh, a lab and we now have a number of people and suddenly, uh, we get a Joy Bryan, who has been apparently a very good supporter of our community, uh, and his company needs to figure out how to fix a certain computer issue. And they'll give you $100,000 to do it. Now this is real. We go, this is going over around the country. So you bring hackers to come in and try to fix the problem. And they may win the $25,000, but the other 75 stays with the structure. So we can grow organically and continue to make our, our uh, impressions work. So I want to leave you with one of the concepts of doing that. Let's look at a facility or facilities similar to what we're doing with our kiddos, as you would say. Uh, and listen, when, when our guys flew in, they were so received by those kids, you saw the smiles on their faces because they were learning something new and interesting and, and they're really ready for that. But we too have to be ready for it. Because I don't want anybody in here to tell me, well, I'm about to retire. You heard what I said. If you retire today and you're a homo sapien, a human, an animal, uh, you retire today, you can cut your brother's breakfast tomorrow because no animal on the face of the earth retires. I want you to retire. Well, politicians, here you go putting on new tires on a car is retiring a car, right? It's an older car. So I want you to retire yourself. And I want you to drive on with new ideas and concepts. You know, as you get to the older age of retirement, you know more than you've ever known. You're emancipated from your kids. You probably have more money than you've ever had. Well, most of you. <laughs> Except those grandkids, of course. Uh, but you have ideas, you have dreams, you have aspirations. Every day when you wake up, you're given 86,400 seconds. That's 24 hours for you math majors out there. And when I wrote my book, Action Has No Season, I coined the word the actioneer. And the actioneer is one who takes their ideas, their dreams, their vision, and their passion, and they pursue them with courage, confidence, and bravado. I want everyone to be an actioneer. I want you to be that existence-based person. I don't want you to continue to, to look back when you're trying to move forward. After all, you wouldn't drive a car by looking in a rearview mirror, so therefore, why would you live your life like that? I want you to be inspired to move forward because it's a, a world that is full of business and opportunities and change. And listen, if you don't embrace change, change will embrace you. So you better be busy controlling your change. I want you all to be actioners. Now, I've written two books, Actioners No Season, Actioners No Season 2.0, and the second one gives an interesting concept of uh, fulfilling questions that you as a business person might have. For example, how to handle the dilemma. <laughs> uh, and then I want you to be able to answer questions that I've put to you in the book. People have always asked me, why can't you just mentor me? Yes, but I'm doing that through the book. Please consider that. 
And two weeks ago, to the surprise of everybody I know, I published my first mystery novel. <laughs> and it's a novel that will take you from Afghanistan uh, and the U.S. Delta Force, and I got to correct uh, terminology from my brother here. But it takes you into the Bahamas, where I'm the largest African-American developer in the Bahamas. And it takes you to England. Uh, it takes you to St. Louis. And it takes you to Ghana. I like Ghana because in 2019, they installed me as a king in Ghana. Uh, thank you. So you don't have to call me your majesty. Or, <laughs> I'm still white, all right? <laughs> They would like for those of us in the diaspora to come to the countries and to bring our knowledge and our wisdom and our talents because Africa is the wealthiest nation on the face of the earth and yet it's the poorest. It has all of the minerals and all the potential that the entire globe would be interested in tipping their hands on. Uh, and they're coming in, but they really want us the African-American family to consider going back and visiting and bringing your expertise. And I encourage everyone to take a moment to do that. Uh, so the mystery book we have for sale, that's a cheap commercial, isn't it? Uh, and it, uh, it takes you through even a character similar to uh, Obama. I think, I think you'll find it interesting. I hope you will. But more importantly, I hope that you found this evening of interest. Yes. I want to congratulate all the honorees. This is a wonderful launch. Uh, next year, when it's uh, offered again, it'll be in a room three times this size. Because we have to recognize excellence in our own community. Because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? And why wouldn't we? I mean, as I said in the early part of this whole discussion tonight, it takes a village. And we are a village. We are all related through DNA. We all have similarities. We like the same music. We enjoy dressing up. We enjoy good food. And the mayor says he knows how to barbecue, but you know, I'll have to have a contest on that. <laughs> According to uh, Curtis, they may have a cornbread contest coming up here at some point. You see what I mean? We all, get it. we all enjoy the same humor. And so I think we have to prepare ourselves now to make all the money that we can, because we don't have a choice anymore. The playing field is level. It's up to you, individually, to be able to make a move. Go to uh, YouTube and, 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 and watch some TED Talks. Learn about and listen to different people talking about futuristic businesses and opportunities. Some of it may scare you, but it's okay. We gotta get scared in order to get straight. We're gonna have to be able to pull ourselves together and make the most of it. And we will, I can assure you. I'm a, I'm a kid that started from nothing. And we got graduated from law school, my brother graduated from college, and my mama graduated from college the same week. So where did I get my tenacity? Probably from her. If she wasn't gonna let her little kids outdo her, she was gonna get that degree. I have four kids and all four of them are lawyers. My brother has three, two of them are lawyers and the other has a master's degree. So education is extremely important. We cannot deny the fact that higher education is critical to what we're doing and where we have to go. But I suggest to you that it isn't always necessary, but it is necessary for you to be informed, for you to be ready, for you to continue to disrupt yourself. And I just say to you in those 86,400 seconds, the moment you think of the moment, it's already gone, 
and you will never get it back. So either you use it or you will lose it. So I want to thank you very much. I want you all to become actionaires and listen to this. Listen to this. You know when people say have a, have a nice day and all that, I, I don't really know what that means. So I created something that's even better. And I want you all to help me spread it around. And I want you to say to people, have an achieving day. Did you catch that? Yeah. Have an achieving day. And now we set ourselves on a course. So I want you all to become great actionaires. I want you to become successful. I want you to become futurists. I want you to be business people. I want you to be a capitalist with a social agenda because you can do more for poor folks if you have money than if you just talk about it. So we need to step up, step out, and become great right here in this town. I love it. Love you. Thank you very much.